Hi everyone, um, this is Alison Powell. I'm one of the investigators on the Virtue Project and I'm here setting up for the Mozilla Festival where the Virtue Project is going to be doing an emergent session called Virtue Sandbox, Design Dilemmas in Connected Technologies. In the Design Sandbox, we're going to be um, helping to uh, think about ethics by walking everyone through the decision making that you might make in a small company. So our idea is we've invited our participants to become the designers and, um, and managers of a small technology company that uh, makes wearables. And they're about to sell this, uh, this product to a bigger company. And they have to make some decisions about how they're going to manage the data. Are they going to store all of the data that they're collecting from these wearables? Everybody's uh, pulse rate, sleep time, steps, movement. Are they going to store that all locally? Um, are they going to destroy it after people have accessed their own personal information? Are they going to let the company collect all of this information and data about people and put it into a great big repository, uh, link it together, and use it for corporate decision making? Is the big company that our small company is selling our product to going to sell all of that data to a third party out into the cloud and make a lot of extra money? So all of these decisions have ethical implications. And what we want to do is play around with the consequences of what seems like a really technical decision. Where am I going to store my data? And show how that actually can be an ethical decision. And we're going to explore whether knowing about ethics and knowing about the moment at which you can make a decision uh, changes the way you manage data within an, a technology company. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to um, do a little bit of imagining with me. So, um, we are all working at a company. Our company is called Wearwell. So if you look through this, if you open, open this, these little, our company is called Wearwell. Now the goal of the company is we're really, really, really concerned with employee well-being. You know, people work and they work too much and we want to develop technology that can help people work more productively and be happier and make everybody, you know, it's a win-win situation. If the employers are, employees are happy, the employers are happy, there's fewer sick days, things are just better. So. We've been working really hard in creating this product. Um, so you are a group of fantastic designers and developers. You're very diverse. And what we're asking you to do is work with, my, with me and think through how we're going to design this thing. So one of the things that you have, the last page there, is a device specification, which tells you what is it that we are doing. There's also some, some concerns. We've also thought a little bit about what do we do, what are we doing? How do we measure impact? How do we think about security and privacy? Because clearly this is going to be important. important. And other options that we might want to consider. We really haven't thought about that, but uh, we're asking you as a group of designers and developers to help us think through it. So, this is the product. The biggest decision that we have to make right now is about how we deal with the data and the relationships between the company, the employees, and us, the wearwell. So the decision that we want you to make today is to help us think through what might be the options. So here we see we have some options about what we're going to do with the data. So we're a little company, and we're going to sell a product to a big company. So our small company is made this amazing product, and right now we are trying to figure out what we are going to do with the data that our product collects. We know that our product is very good in terms of its technical specifications. Now we need to figure out how we are going to mat how we are going to sell uh, sell our kind of data promise. And this is a design decision that's part of our product development process. So we've kind of laid out four different options for all of that data. If we are a company that is typical of the companies that we've studied in the Virtue product in the Virtue project, we either have 
external funding that is not venture capital funding, angel investor funding, or v venture capital funding. Yes, it changes everything. Um, most typically, if you have venture capital funding, when you are making this decision, you are also making this decision about how the VCs are going to see the growth of your business. And, they're, and they are going to be um, expecting the decision you make here as a design decision to also be a business decision about how much return the venture capitalists are going to get um, on their uh, device. So, Irina, do we think that we can let our design teams decide how their product, uh, product has been funded, or do we want to say that these are VC funded? I think given that we only have an hour, we're going to force them into a model of funding because there's a lot of other things they're going to need to decide. If we had more than, than an hour, we would definitely let you decide this. But just for now, bear with us. Yeah, we have some VCs, but they're really progressive. And they really think that, you know, unicorn growth is not a huge goal and it'd be nice, but they will be okay with us growing much more steadily and uh, they're a bit more progressive than you would normally think. How's that? We're developing this part of our product so we can get a really big client which can help us to, uh, to, to, to grow as a small company. So think about it this way. We're looking for an employer that would love to, wear, to use our product and distribute it to all their employees. Now the question is, how do we deal with data? So let me walk you through the options really quickly. And you can have the options that are a little bit distributed over there. So option A is we track, we track everything that's on the Wear Well, but it's stored locally. It's stored locally. Well, safe, sure. The company gets aggregate reports because the device reports only aggregates out and we then give the company an aggregate report. That's option A. Now think about the implications of this both from the design and from the company survival point of view. Option B, we track and store data temporarily. So we get the data. It doesn't stay locally. We see the data. We can do much more processing on the data and thus we can offer more, um, more services, but we have a, it's a temporary data store. Once the data is processed and we made the necessary decisions to provide the service, the data is erased. So that's step two. Data travels a bit, but not a lot. Again, think of the implications of this. Three, we track we keep for development and for improvement of our services, but we don't share the granular data with the company. Uh, the whole time the company is getting more general reports. And finally, option D, it's much more common. We sh track everything. We share everything with the company. We wash our hands. The company gets to decide what they want to do with the data. All of it. So option D tends to be the option that is chosen for these kinds of, of, uh, of products. It's the option that appears to, uh, to give you the greatest possible return in financial terms because you're opening up the data that you're collecting to your client company and the client company is then able to look at all of that data. The data itself then becomes a product, not just the device that we've all designed so carefully, but the data is also a product in option D. Yes. This is tracked information. There is a link between the ID of the band um, and all the information on the band in option D. So that means that, like the, the, that you are uh, employee number 156754. All of your data is then sent to your client company. They presumably have another data store that has the relationship between your name and your employee number in, in, uh, within the company that you're working for. So the question, is not about the, the question is not about whether this is compliant in a regulatory sense. This is really the design decision making within the small companies. So, that, so this would be designed to be, option D would, would regardless be designed to be compliant. Everything's going to be compliant, but that's a very different method because it changes the infrastructure. When you're processing locally, um, the, when the amount of data is much less, it's individual data, you don't have comparison data, you don't have the kind of computational might that you need for certain kinds of uh, processing and analysis. So what you do is you limit severely the kinds of services and the kinds of um, analysis that you can then provide as feedback back for the people who, who are using this device. 
So with every step, you're increasing the kinds of services that you can offer. And then with option D, one of the things with option D is that the, the, the data then can be used by third parties with the obviously legally compliant to also offer additional services that potentially would be useful. So the trade-off is always between functionality and the kinds of ways that we might want to treat data. So uh, I want to also talk a little bit about option C. Um, can you go back to option C? So this is an option where, as Wearwell, we track the data. We don't share the data uh, with the client company except in its most aggregate form. Um, but Wearwell gets the option to do A-B testing. So A-B testing means that we then have a stock of data that we hold as Wearwell that is about the, uh, the employee's kind of measurement. And if we're thinking about this from a kind of internet health perspective, what can we then do if we're A-B testing? What are the benefits and risks of a constantly A-B testing our product design? Like, are we going to try to encourage people to go to bed earlier? Are we going to, you know? Force them, do you mean? Ah, so here's, this is an interesting question, right? So we don't force them to do anything, and because we're not sharing this with the, with the overall, with the bigger company, you know, it really has to do with what we decide as a small company that our business, what we want our business model to be. So what is it, is it kind of, Will we lose out on the sustainability of our business if we decide not to do any A-B testing? If we decide, uh, that's option B, by the way. Option C is we decide to do A-B testing. We experiment with other possible services that we could provide. We could continue to market ourselves as a sort of you know, company that promotes health, um, but we'd be experimenting on the data. We can offer some more um, services if we get the data, but the data store is temporary. So all we do is we define several services that are possible given the data we get, it, we get in. We don't do any longitudinal analysis. It's just, it comes in, we do a little bit of analysis. We perhaps suggest that somebody walk more or meditate more or sleep more or whatever, and then we delete the data. Uh, op option B is reflected in um, data storage and management practices for other kinds of data. So option B, for example, is how uh, internet um, data is stored in data centers, right? So all communications data in the UK uh, is maintained in a data store for 30 days. And there is the possibility of the security services, for example, or other entities to do analysis, but only temporarily, and then the data disappears. So this is also to kind of like uh, give you an example of other uh, data management practices that already exist in, in, uh, in different spheres. But we have such a good product that we are in a unique position right now as a design team to get to make a decision about the way that we're going to, 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 uh, to, to bring data management into our, design, into our design practice. And so the product is good enough in this scenario that we've got the power to tell, the bit, to tell our client company what our strategy is going to be. There are the ethics involved in what we're doing here. And the goal of the project is to think about where ethics is involved and how and why. And there, the thing about ethics is it's not about whether a decision is ethical or not, it's how you get there. And so the next step is how do we get there? What are some of the ways that we might want to think about this? So now that you've made your decision, we want to remind you about the fact that the fundamental values for this company are well-being and privacy, and we really want to live up to that. So this, is a this is a design problem, right? Can we actually get at any of those ethical questions at this point in the design decision, decision process, given that we are like embedded in this bigger structure, right? And we are encouraged to think about ethical principles like virtue, the virtue of being healthy for example. So we are invited to think about healthiness is a sort of virtuous, desirable, ethical end. Is it worth the means of getting to the desirable, virtu virtuous, ethical end of you know, designing a system in which we don't even have the capacity to say you can I opt in or out at, as, as Wearwell's designers. We are just making something, and these are the things that we can decide about. And so we have all kinds of views on this. And we as a design team will come at it from a particular set of backgrounds, from a particular set of uh, experiences, and a particular kind of politics that we've all internalized and believe that's how, that's what a just and a good world looks like. So um, I wanted to introduce um, 
an employee at one of our testing companies that's been helping us out and sort of just testing out the product to give you a little bit of, an, of, of a glimpse into what it's like to use Wearwell in a company. And uh, so you can listen to sort of the end user voice. You want to be the end user voice? Okay, hi, I'm the end user. I work in the sales department at Big Company. Uh, and I've got you know, two kids. I love Wearwell. It's helped me keep a lot of mental clarity on difficult days. I'm super excited about the new period tracking feature. Um, I've always had a lot of pain and mood swings with my period makes it hard to come to work. So I've, I've shared my data with my line manager and finally he understands and lets me work from home when I need to. And so the meditation requirement goes up when I have my period, but it's cool, like I can, I hear from studies that it helps, you know, to do more meditation when you're, you know, in a, in a situation of more stress. Um, so yeah, that's really my experience of using Wearwell. And really, there are quite a few employees that feel that getting Wearwell is something that is, the company is really showing that they're caring about more than just dumb efficiency that you know by providing spaces for meditation and things like that the company is actually making the employees feel um, a little bit more like a, a community or a family and um, less like a sort of a farm where they come in and they do their thing and they leave so there's there's some voices to that that we're hearing that are quite um they're perhaps um you know, in this case, in that particular company, it's a technical company, so there are fewer women in the company, but they're really enjoying having this, um, this technology. When we look at, at, at larger numbers, yeah, when we look at larger numbers, we get fairly average reviews, and then the employees generally kind of find it. It's fine. They don't, they, you know, they're not either super excited about it or super upset, but the averages are pretty much sort of where you would expect them. Nobody's, like, super excited, but generally, you know, we're slightly on the positive side of things, so, you know. Um, but uh, what we, the reason why is because there's some minority voices that kind of get lost in the... Um, in the in the in the larger averages, I'm just saying. <laughs> well, you know, you just heard from one. <laughs> that is a minority voice. And I agree with all of this, but what I also want to point out is something important: is that uh, when, as a design team, we come at this and we think about these issues of how do you conceptualize well-being and who owns the data, we also need to remember that we're coming at this from a very specific, very Western, uh, very white middle class to upper middle class kind of position. And that um, we're also imposing our view of what's important onto a range of people, many of whom may be in completely different positions. And so one of the things that we're trying to do with this is to say that there are and can be very, very different reactions and views on this that will, that will put this into conflict with the kinds of views that you think are right. So I want you to think about the fact that your position in the world, no matter how just and how good you think it is, it also may be imposing a set of ideas and views on people who would potentially actually benefit greatly from a device that's carefully designed like this. So just a dismissal of it um, may be something that is, again, getting imposed. So there is an ethical question there also to reflect on your own position and your own assumptions. So that's a design decision, and it's a change in how the design process would happen and both also how the implementation process would happen for this device. But it is also recognition, and then perhaps we don't know best. And perhaps we need to restructure our decision making rather than just having this turn up as if it was almost a kind of commercial for how great our product is likely to be. And I have to say that the last time we did this talk, and you know, we talked about period tracking, the audience responded in a very different way because the audience was made up of a very different set of people. So that yeah. is, this is a, perhaps an atypical design team in terms of its diversity and its makeup. What was the reaction? People got uncomfortable with Lewis said the word period. <laughs> <laughs> Say what?
People got uncomfortable as soon as we said the word period. <laughs> what we're doing here is we're bringing in this idea and we're challenging this idea that you want to be ethical, but you need to be reflective of your own ethics because it's a position. Ethics, ethics is a position. It's a way of thinking. It's not, and there are many different ethics, many different ways of thinking, and they all will lead you to a different decision process. You might end up at the same decision, but it'll be a different decision process. Very interesting ethical question because we have been assuming that we are going to act ethically on behalf of some people who are going to benefit from our actions, which are to care for them, which of course has its own political stance, which we might also call paternalism. Uh, and it is often used as a way of arguing for something that is good ethically. Say, oh, we're going to go and care for you know these other group of people. And if there is no notion of whether that other group of people have autonomy in defining or the capability to define their own meaning for what it means to be cared for or whether they would actually like to be cared for or not, is outside so far of the you know the, the decision making patterns that that we've been uh, that we've been engaged in. And this is the real challenge of practical ethics because I feel so far that we've got a kind of practical ethics that's embedded in a kind of extracted extractive mode of political economy. So the limits of our practical ethics are somehow constrained by the limits of like how we are invited to package up, buy and sell, and what is on the axis of options. So what's, uh, you pointed this out earlier, what's on the axis of options is not the full range of options, but it is an axis of options that's provided by the existing data-based you know, uh, market and, uh, and frame. Um, I'm not even, you know, we can call it what you like. I, I, you know, you could call it a political economy. You could call it surveillance capitalism. You could call it, um, you know, the way the world works now. And I think one of the things we've been trying to do in our project, and I realize we are going to have to draw to a close uh, momentarily, is act, hmm? Eight minutes, okay. Irina, what else do you want to talk about in eight minutes? Okay, so um, <laughs> let, me, let me just give you a little bit of a framework of what it is that we're actually doing. So this, is, this was actually, normally it's designed for a two hour workshop, and it, and it works a little bit more uh, dynamically, and we also typically have people stand up and move around to options instead of argue with each other. <laughs> but we didn't have to get you to stand up to argue with each other, so that's great. <laughs> and in any case, so we have these three interventions. Once we give you, um, once once we gave you the frame, we gave three two, two interventions. The third intervention is this one. It's a little uh, email that you get that basically says, "Oh, our algorithm is a little bit like it. It works. We got some data." Uh, the training set problems. It works on certain for certain populations, not for others. It's a little bit less useful for, you know, we we notice some irregularities. Some people benefit more than others. Do we still want to do it? How do we deal with this? Um, and then you know you have a discussion. And I'm not going to put this as an actual option. Just sort of walking you through what's left because we only have eight minutes. Because in in the essence, what we're doing is this. We're a project about ethics, and what we're thinking about is what does it mean to have a practical ethics? A practical ethics that uh, allows you to think through some of the dilemmas and some of the problems that, um, that you have to work with as a designer or a developer, and to acknowledge that, you're working, that your wiggle room is actually fairly small. There's not so much that a lot of people who work within design and development um, that have startups or work for bigger companies, a lot of times the wiggle room for deciding what's right and what's wrong there's too many competing pressures. And uh, there is not a single ethical framework that will let you make all the right decisions because none of them are complete. And all of them have their positives and they have their negatives and they cover so some situations and not others. And so what you've actually observed is three different ethical frameworks in action. Um, right, where are we? Uh, so what's ethics, right? Right, so we looked at consequentialism and then we said, nah, <laughs> doesn't work. Because. You did make some consequentialist arguments earlier. I'm sure you recognize the common 
good. The idea of the individual, the idea of the greatest utility for the greatest, the greatest benefit for all. We are going to roll this out to everyone because we think well-being is the is the is the overall goal. And this is also in, um, connected to the idea of the personal and individual virtue. We're all going to become better people by getting better feedback and learning to meditate more often and maybe go to bed earlier. Right. So then we came in and we said, okay, well, but one of the um, gaining frameworks for ethics, ethical frameworks right now is virtue ethics. And virtue ethics is about, it's about um, developing a moral character. It's the individual developing a moral character. You have to do the right thing. And how do you know to do the right thing? Well, you develop a moral character that allows you to decide what's the, what is the right thing. Um, and it allows you, in essentially, you need to focus on values. So us reminding you that the company's values are privacy and well-being is a way to think about, because one of the ways that virtue ethics works is it makes you consider your reputation. Do you want to be known as a company that doesn't respect privacy? Well, maybe you should make them decisions so that this doesn't show up in a newspaper article. Can I give a philosophical definition of privacy? So the philosophical definition of privacy in a rights-based framework is the right to be let alone. So what does it mean to be left alone? So it doesn't mean not collecting information about you. It means not acting on that information to infringe upon your right to be left alone. And in essence, if you consider it as a li right to be left alone, you as a person, it's not your responsibility to be left alone. It's the responsibility of everyone else around you to leave you alone. So in the rights-based framework right now, privacy is defined as the right to control, which shifts all of the responsibility for your data onto the individual. So in GDPR, the, those two are fairly, um, those two are at odds, but these are two different definitions of privacy. So in essence, you know, as where well, you would have to figure out what you mean by privacy in order to design this. And that would need to be a discussion, unless you basically say privacy is compliance. Which a lot of companies do say privacy is compliance, and we started out as well with tons of questions about GDPR. Like, as if GDPR was going to let a company be ethical. What we've discovered across our three years of research is that as, as soon as GDPR came out, companies started saying, well, we comply with GDPR, so we can say what, that we're an ethical company. And so none of these questions that we are now raising about what actually like an, an ethics in practice looks like are represented by that, well, we complied with GDPR. I'm also really sad because in the months before GDPR, I thought there might be an opportunity to make the GDPR like a a basement that you could build an amazing set of like different kinds of technologies and business models around that would think about you know this sort of like compliance as the very very bare minimum and con and kind of concoct out an entire ecosystem. I know my 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 my, my enthusiasm is undampened by my 15 years of experience. <laughs> I mean, the day after GDPR came out, I was like, hope dashed again. <laughs> Virtue is kind of your goal. But what we did with, um, what we did with the user study, and sort of bringing in these minority voices and re reminding the designers that you're not all knowing, and that you are, your position and your view needs to be challenged, needs to be reflected. And sometimes your notions of justice come from a very specific place. And so care ethics forces you to think about the minority voices, the kinds of relationships that you're intervening in, what's already there and why it's there, and what is actually something that needs to be considered. But care has limits. You can't care about everything. And so really, the last one is when we came in and said, but the algorithm only works for this kinds of people, and not those kinds of people are kind of worse. Do we still do it? Is that Capabilities approach is the th third one that we use that gives you the idea that you need to think about the kinds of constraints that are there. And the capabilities approach is interesting because it's about, um, it's about what are you capable of, of yourself, the designers, what are your capabilities given the structural constraints that you work with. But also thinking about the fact that the things you develop become constraints and capabilities, something that allows, something that encourages, enables, and, cons and constrains for the people that use these technologies. I have one
one last thing to say about this triangle. As you can see, the triangle has different points of entry. And we don't think that any of the points of entry is necessarily sufficient, but I actually think they are all enabling in different ways. If you begin with thinking about how you are, uh, how you are trying to put ethics in practice as a way, as an entry point from one of these points, you may be able to exert some, you know, to, to, to exert some influence at those. If we're thinking about what Giles pointed out about the whole like idea of designer and the, the, the role of the designers in enabling these kinds of weird constraints, right? Like we got into like, oh wait, even if we make a good technology, it might have a really bad outcome. That's a question of capabilities. And I think um, from my own perspective, the space in between care and capabilities, but pr starting from the notion of capabilities, can enable us to do a lot of different things because we can start thinking, what are the capabilities to change the design field, for example, so that we have, you know, people who are uh, enabled to act in different ways. Um, and, you know, if we start from that perspective, you know, how can we push towards thinking about care in a less paternalistic way, in a more enabling way? Um, obviously, my enthusiasm I remains you unbound. Like from half of you, I'm sorry. I yeah. Thank you so much for thank coming. you for coming. Amazing.